Welcome to the Disruptor Network Podcast. Welcome back to the Disruptors Network Podcast. We have an amazing guest today in Shahana Downing. She's the, the co-founder and chief visionary officer of Speaker House. Now, Speaker House is something that's teaching people not just to speak in public, but to speak in general. What I learned from Shahana uh, by listening to her before this podcast and what we're going to learn from her during this podcast is that we're preparing to speak and speaking to people in public every single day. It's not just in front of crowds. And she's really empowering not just women, but everybody to be better speakers to help themselves better themselves, better their careers, and better their lives. So without further ado, here we go, Shahana Downing. Ignition. Lift off. Welcome back to the Disruptors Network Podcast. And we have a really, really exciting guest today. Uh, I have some personal stuff to question you about because I, you, just researching about you uh, brought a lot of stuff to mind. But we have Shahara Downing, who's the co-founder and chief visionary officer of Speak House, amongst a million other things. But welcome to the, the show, Shahana. Yes, thank you for having me, Ralph. Um, so just going through kind of your story and doing some research and some past interviews you've done, I remember how, how big of a problem public speaking was for me um, through high school and college and as I kind of got out into the world. And I heard a little bit of your story as, as that you kind of were put out there to do it early on. But how did you first start gaining your own voice and confidence in speaking? And then how did, you, how did that lead you to show others how to do it? You know, I, I take it all the way back to fifth grade, okay? And, That's and awesome. when, I, when I tell my story, I want y'all to go all the way back as far as you can for anybody who's listening, you know, to think about when did your public speaking become embraced by yourself, you know, right? When did you start to really understand I've got a voice? And for me, I would say it started when I was in fifth grade because they had this program. And, you know, when you get picked for stuff, you really just want to go for the pizza, right? 100%. <laughs> <laughs> so they had this thing called the Maywood Mediators, and they hand selected some fifth graders to uh, train them in conflict management. Isn't that something? And so they gave us this training. They gave us these clipboards. And then on this like sheet of paper, they kind of gave us like the process, the steps that we have to go through. And then we got these green sashes and they threw us out to the playground so that if there was any, and I just keep it plain, if kids were beefing, we were <laughs> supposed to get in the middle of the beef <laughs> and then resolve the conflict through this process. And so I, I give that story because outside of my family unit, my parents and you know my aunts and uncles, outside of them, this was probably my, my earliest memory of adults and other people affirming my voice. You know, saying you're 10 years old, but you have a voice and there's something that you can do with it. And oftentimes when we're young, we're told, you know, only spoke when you're spoken to, you know, no, you can't be a part of this conversation. So there's a lot of like suppressors that happen in our, in our youth. And so I share that story because I know that that's like a, a, a very fond memory of me getting up into people's business, not being, <laughs> not being uh, afraid to just kind of like voice my opinion, share my thoughts, um, enter into conversations. And I believe that that's where public speaking begins. So for anybody that's listening, I just say, you know, think back to that moment where either one, your voice was affirmed. And more importantly, if, you, if you're challenged with public speaking, think about that moment where you feel like your voice was suppressed or you were silenced because that is what's holding you back if you still have apprehension about speaking up. So I like how, sim how simple you make it because that really sounds simple, right? Like when, when did somebody really want to hear your voice and they asked you to speak and think back to that? What do you do with people that, because now you made me think of something, right? Like what do you do with people who are shy and, and naturally didn't speak? So maybe it wasn't something that was told to them. Maybe it was something that was just internal and they just like, I don't feel comfortable speaking at an early age. I mean, do you find that people still carry that a lot into adulthood as, as you meet them? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, there's there's two different things. There, there are people who have no problems uh, speaking in front of crowds. Right. There are people who are like, once I get in front of, you know, a handful of folks, I feel comfortable. Right. Then you got some people who are just like, no, you know, I feel better when it's just a one on one conversation. But then sometimes, you know, so there's different spaces where people find their comfort and where people don't. But wherever that space is that you feel challenged, I say take the focus off of you and put the focus on 
the connection? What are y'all trying to exchange? Because the reason why sometimes we feel a fear of speaking up, whether it's in front of one person or many, is because we just don't want to look dumb. We don't want to look stupid. We don't want to look silly. We don't want to look like we don't know what we're talking about. We don't want people listening to what we have to say. And then on the other side, be whispering, like, oh my God, I can't believe that Ralph said that. <laughs> I mean, what the hell is he talking about? You know, so in our mind, we think that's what people are doing. And sometimes people are, y'all. But take your focus off of that and just focus on how are you wanting to connect with the person that you're talking to? What's the purpose of the conversation? Are you supposed to be getting to know each other? Is it work related? Are you accomplishing a particular goal? What's the connection? Concentrate on the connection and then you don't have to worry about feeling self-conscious about you know, what people are whispering. That's great. Yeah, that's the, and you know, you're right about that too when people are thinking, because I always try to tell people, I'm comfortable speaking in front of crowds now, but I wasn't always, and it did repetitions, right? But um, I tell people when you get up there on stage, just realize that they want you to do as well as you want yourself to do. Because if you bomb up there, it's awkward for them too. They're like, oh, I don't want to watch this. Oh, this is terrible. So like, just try to put it in your brain that everybody's kind of rooting for you, even though you're right, some people aren't every single right. time. Um, what is the biggest obstacle you see facing in becoming a skilled public speaker at this point? Like as you, as you bring people in and as they obtain more confidence, what do you think is the biggest obstacle they face in becoming a good public speaker? The negative self-talk. That just So you're either worried about what other people are thinking about you. And if you're worried about what other people are thinking about you, there's a narrative that's running in your own head and you're almost affirming the unsaid. Nobody's even said anything about you, but you're saying it about yourself just by worrying like, oh, are they gonna think this or are they gonna think that? Um, the other part of that negative self-talk also looks like most people get nervous speaking on subject matters, arenas, rooms that they're not familiar with, right? So if you're, if it's an unfamiliar space, unfamiliar content, unfamiliar subject matter, now all of a sudden we start to feel insecure, like, ooh, this ain't what I talk about. I'm not even gonna, and, and it's natural. But we also do that in spaces where we know we know what we're talking about. And we still start to second guess whether or not we're proficient enough, whether or not we understand our content enough, whether or not we feel like we're experienced enough. You know, there's that whole thing that people talk about imposter syndrome, but it's really just that the negative uh, self-talk and the stories that we tell ourselves that really become the true obstacle. You can, you can talk negatively about what you know, or you can choose to talk pos positively about what you do now. Yeah, yeah. It's the, it's the, again, I like how you kind of simplify things because you make it very easy to kind of to see it clearly. So you do a great job of doing that. And um, I'm gonna I'm gonna use a personal story to ask you another question now. So I had um, I had a keynote speech about a year ago, and it was my first one in front of a really a big crowd. And I was pre preparing for it, but probably not as much as I should have been. And bef a week before the speech. Uh, somebody had told me a story about their interaction with Tim Story, who obviously is one of the best speakers in the country, right? And, and uh, it was somebody who had been in the room with him. And she's like, I'm a very, very good speaker, but he got on the stage and blew me away. So when he got off the stage, I asked him, you know, how are you so good up there? He's like, you see that 45 minutes I just did up there? He's like, I prepared for nine hours. And this is somebody who speaks all the time. So when he said, and she said that to me, I was like, I'm not anywhere near prepared enough. So how much preparation do you, do you advise people to, to have when they have to speak in public? So the one thing that I will say to people is, I, I always say this as Speak House saying that we have is, you know, public speaking is every time you open up your mouth and <laughs> words fall out, and somebody else is listening. Because I always <laughs> preface, sometimes we open up our mouths and we're talking to ourselves, right? Correct. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but anytime, so this is really reframing what public speaking is. And public speaking isn't always on a stage in front of an audience behind a podium Good with point. a PowerPoint yeah. and a microphone and light shining in your eyes. Sometimes it's a different variation of that. Sometimes it's in your office in the front of the conference room. Sometimes it's over lunch with some of your colleagues. Sometimes it's getting on that Instagram, that Facebook live. You know, sometimes it's the casual conversation 
that turns into a crucial connection that you didn't think that you were going to make at this networking event. And so the reason why I want you to reframe the way that you think about public speaking is because every time you open up your mouth, it is a stage. Every time you put your thoughts together, it is preparation. Do not devalue using verbal communication as just a, a, a way of life. It is a tool. It is, I, I call it an ancient technology and it's not going anywhere. It's, it's the one thing that creates connections, that creates buildings and society. Like that is, communication is that tool. So when we, when we limit it to just on stage, we diminish the value of even just conversations like you and I are having. This is the preparation. This is the practice. You don't have to then Turn it on. <laughs> All right, Ralph, I'm ready today. I've got my talking points. <laughs> you know, don't nobody talk like that. You're right. <laughs> You're so your preparation is how thoughtful you are about your everyday conversations and not diminishing your voice just because it's not on a stage, just because it's not behind a podium. It's crazy you say that because it's really so true because you I meet some people who do speak on television or on stage and when you meet them at first they're a little bit awkward. Like they walk into the room and it's a little bit but as soon as the camera goes on it's like, bang, it goes on so it's funny that you say that because if you're just naturally this way all the time, it's easier that you don't have to turn it on and off so, so, so that really makes a lot of sense to me that just be yourself. Okay. Yeah, and, and there are different styles, okay? Like, you know, it, it's, it's like almost like fashion, right? You, if you're going to step into a really nice restaurant, maybe you will change your style a little bit. You're going to a baseball game, you'll put your jersey on. You know, you're going to the beach. There's different, there, there are different things that you'll put on in a way, you know, that fits the setting. So yes, if you are giving a formal presentation, there are different things that you can do and practice that make that presentation more engaging, sure. more memorable. Um, and then if you're in a, a pitch competition, there is a particular way to frame your talk, to frame your pitch. But in order to feel better prepared for some of those specific stages and some of those specific styles of speaking, uh, don't undervalue the everyday conversation be thoughtful and intentional. Don't just let your words come out haphazardly. Understand that when the words come out, they are literally a vehicle for connecting with people. And if you can value that in everyday moments, then you'll feel like you've been showing up even before you show up on a formal stage. Yeah. And you know, it's funny because when I first see Speak House and I speak, see your background in public speaking, you're right. Immediately, I think of in front of a crowd or in front of a stage. And, and I like that you're reframing it because being a good public speaker can help you in every aspect of life. It doesn't have to just be on a stage, but then if you get on a stage, it makes it a lot easier. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, my next question, and you kind of just gave me the answer. I'm going to ask you anyway. Um, ask you anyway. It, 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 it's, but what are the, some pillars you give people to speak more confidently that are the kind of foundation actions? Like, of, 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 you know what I mean? It's like, what are some things, but you gave me some, but I'm sure you have some more. <laughs> yeah. And, and this is totally different, right? Like if you join us at Speak House, whether it's in some one-on-one -on -one coaching or whether it's in our group coaching, which we call our social, and we call it a social because most of your crucial moments or conversions into contacts, clients, coins happen in conversation, right? Happen at the bar happen with champagne in your hand. So we, it, it's, it's a workshop, yeah. Ralph, but it's a social because yeah. you know, we're trying to replicate reality when, we, when we're practicing. But you know, there are certain frameworks that we share with Speak House. But the, the thing that I always advise people to do to become better speakers is what I call PMRJ, PMRJ. And the PMRJ stands for prayer, meditation, reading, and journaling. And whether you're doing all four or whether you're doing one of the four, the goal behind those is about centering yourself. 
It is about self-awareness. If you see someone who's confident, it's because they are grounded, they are centered, they are in alignment. If you see someone who commands a room, it's because they first have command of themselves. It's not because I'm telling you what to do that I have command in the room. The presence of who I am now makes you feel like I'm setting the tone for how you should feel. And you can't accomplish some of these, what I call the woo woo of speaking, the charm, the charisma, the confidence, the presence, the command. Like these are very intangible things, which I believe is why uh, public speaking has it, like the opportunity to really uh, fine tune it as a skill is more difficult because you're not crunching numbers, right? It's more of an art. But those aspects, when people see a great speaker, the authenticity, how you think you're going to come across authentic when you're not even familiar with who you are? How do you feel that you're going to share a real, a real aspect of yourself when you're still showing up to work with a mask on? You know, all of that work happens with intentional practice. So whether you pray, uh, whether you meditate, whether you do self-reflection and journaling, or whether or not you read so that you have a better understanding of who you are, you know, those are the things that as you build that self-awareness, as you build that comfort with yourself, when you show up in other places, I always say this, Ralph, real recognize real at the end of the day. Right. And people can tell immediately, energetically, when you're sound with yourself. If you step up on stage, there's one thing to have a fear of public speaking, but it's another fear. And I believe the real fear that people have is the fear of being seen. And yeah. so if, you're not, if you ain't been looking at yourself, if you're unfamiliar with yourself, then when you get out in front of other people, you're going to feel naked as hell. <laughs> so just, it's awesome. That was a great point. And Secondly, you keep stealing my question. So, so I, don't, I don't know if you're in my, head, the question in my head, but, but you just, you really touched on it, but I'm going to say it right now too, is um, I feel like a lot of my own personal confidence and those around me has come with me getting comfortable with my own skin. Like the more comfortable I've gotten in my own skin, the more personal confidence I exude to everybody else. So you put, you talk about kind of your own personality being uniquely yours. I've said, I've heard you say that in other interviews. Right. And I think that's awesome. And talking to you, I see it, it comes through. How, what are your thoughts on, on, and how do you get, how do you get people to get there though? Right. Like you're very, like, and I tell people all the time, I, I, I did a class on social media yesterday for the people in my, uh, in a, a group, in my group. And I said to them, I was like, you have an interesting story. You just have to tell it. Like you're afraid to tell it. So how do you get people to, to get that they're interesting and, 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 and get that they have to tell their story and speak out? Yeah. And, and so I would say that, and I'm going to take it back to just the, the one exercise of journaling. And I know some of you are out there saying, oh my gosh, you're gonna tell me to journal. Like that doesn't mean anything. I don't have <laughs> anything to write. Like this isn't a diary. Um, but I, I provide this as an example because again, moving to that space of familiarity, familiarity with yourself and also familiarity with your own thoughts and ideas. Like if you haven't spent time to just explore the, the thoughts inside of your brain, then when someone asks you a question, it's gonna be the first time that you kind of thought about it. And it takes a lot more time to process, right? But there is, a, um, I believe there's a, a muscle that you build when you start to explore all of the different aisles of thoughts and ideas within your brain. And I believe that journaling is a great way to explore your brain. So now when you show up in a meeting, you know where to go. It, like imagine a, a cavernous warehouse. Imagine like the largest Amazon warehouse somewhere. That is your brain. And if you're not studying it on a day-to-day -day basis, when you have to recall something, share something, when you have to introduce something, imagine having to look in that cavernous like freaking warehouse and like, now where am I supposed to go to get there? <laughs> You know, and then that's where the uhs and the ums come from. That's where the nervousness comes from. That's where you start to feel the pressure. That's when, that's when you start to jumble. I always say that your brain is like an information highway and your mouth is the one way street. You have to be able to direct the traffic so that everything can come out. 
But if you're not familiar with the highways and the byways of your thinking, then of course you're gonna feel scattered. Of course you're gonna lose your train of thought. Of course you're gonna feel lost. And a way to exercise clarity, this is about creating clarity, is to start journaling, putting your words and your thoughts to paper. And the more that you do that, you're creating the content so that when you show up in conversations, you have the meat and potatoes to share because you've been there okay. already. Yeah, it's great. It's self-practice almost. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was, you know, I watched the, uh, in doing research for me, I watched some, some interviews you had, you had done. You, you, you appear in a morning show a decent amount, it looks like, on a mm -hmm. news channel. And um, what I was impressed with is that in watching the interviews, it was a lighthearted show, but they still asked you some questions sometimes that could drag you into probably some controversial topics that mm -hmm. you could have definitely gone with, right? Especially, at, at, and you handled kind of with it with grace and, and you walked around it and you got back to kind of what your point was. That's a skill, obviously. And, and I always tell people, um, I try not to, po I don't ever post things that are negative or speak things that are negative because I don't, and I, I also, I try to educate people and not alienate them. Like, I don't want to, you know, I, I'm really not that into politics anyway, but I don't want to alienate people with my political views, right? Because I'm just, it's not my thing. And I, I don't, everybody's opinion is their own opinion, right? But how do you teach people to speak their truths, but kind of still toe, toe that line where they're not, it's, they're not uh, pushing people away from them? Yeah, you know, I would definitely say one, the skill that you mentioned uh, is what we call media training. And at Speak House, we don't offer specific media training, but because I have a background in media training, I've incorporated some of the tactics that you use to be media trained in um, our, some of our modules, some of our, our workshops, our socials, primarily because we have a lot of clientele who are, you know, like thought leaders, business leaders, and they're kind of like identifying themselves or differentiating themselves from their industry. And so they're showing up at panels, they're showing up here in podcasts, mm -hmm. they're going to conferences. And so you have to have a message, but then you have to figure out how to take whatever the question was and bring it back to your message. So that is a skill. We do talk about some of those aspects and tactics of media training within Speak House, but I would say practice this. And this is, this is a challenge because we, the other reason why we fear public speaking is because we don't wanna be hated. We don't wanna <laughs> be like, everybody wants to be liked and everybody wants to be loved. Yes. And that's why we sometimes avoid controversial subject matters because we don't wanna give people a reason to dislike us. There is, a great way to exercise confidence by not caring who likes you or who do, does not. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really good, yeah. Sometimes you just gotta take a little bit of a risk. Sometimes you just got to muster up the courage to maybe just speak on something that you know could polarize people. But if you share your thought or your opinion just from how you feel, just, you know, and you're, you're approaching it like, hey, this is a really tough subject matter. This is just how I feel about it. You know, people can disagree with you, but as long as you're just sharing in the space of the question was asked, this is what the conversation is about. I'm not gonna avoid it. You're exercising courage. You're showing your confidence. Yeah. because you're not worried about whether or not people are going to hate you or like you. Um, and you're also exercising an aspect of authenticity. Like this is, this is true to me. And I, I'm, I don't, I'm not here to offend anyone. And I apologize for it. Yeah. I, I, yeah. But if, you know, this is how I feel. This, I, 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 and it's, it, you use the word courage in that. And I, and I think that's a really good point. I saw something that was on the news yesterday that I went back and watched. Um, it was sports related. I like sports, but it was uh, Stephen A. Smith had, a couple of different people on a show and he had JJ Reddick, who's a former basketball player. And he had Chris Russo, who's kind of like a shock jock host. And he, they're two different age groups and two different thought patterns. And Chris Russo said something about, you know, Draymond Green basically shouldn't be talking after the game on his own podcast about what goes on in the league. And JJ Reddick said, that's that shut up and dribble mentality that they talk about on Fox news and all this other stuff. And I don't subscribe to it. And this is why I don't, this is why you're wrong. But he said it in a way 
that that wasn't offensive, that was passionate from where he was coming from. It was coming from a place that he knew. And after it was over, I mean, I respected, I liked him to begin with, but I respected him even more that he spoke up in that situation. So you're right. It could be really a positive spin and it would be hard for any kind of detractor to look at him and say, that guy's nobody's talking about. Because mm-hmm. he came from yeah. a place of really information and, and passion with about the subject. Yeah. And you, and you know what, Ralph, you just gave me an idea for anybody else who's out there listening. You know, if you do watch like, the first takes and all of those, you know, you know, with the delay, whatever. Yeah. But yeah. when you're watching those, they one are extremely entertaining. Um, but I would say that those are great spaces to watch people on how they share their thoughts, their ideas, and their opinions. Sometimes it can seem combative, which I think is magnified just because it's on TV. A hundred percent, yes. <laughs> but, you know, sports gets really, uh, people get really passionate about it. But sports now, because there's a 24-hour news cycle on sports, that's the reason why it is becoming so politicized, you know, because we got to have something else to talk about. You're right. And and Good so, and, and you're absolutely right, there's, there's a lot of tender subjects and tender topics that are brought up through the, the, the guise of sports. And so now we're seeing the athletes as more than just athletes. We're looking at them as brands. We're looking at them as humans. And sometimes people don't want to do that. And that alone is quite political. Yeah. But if you're watching those shows, observe don't get so caught up in the in the tea and the drama what's going on but really watch the the commentators because they're having conversation they're sitting on panels giving thoughts and opinions they sometimes are defending their opinions and they have to manage their emotions there's so much that happens on those shows so if you do watch them really look at the delivery. Look at how yeah. they're exchanging ideas. No, it's good. It's a good point. And that shows an example. And Stephen A. Smith is somebody that I don't agree with everything he says, but he comes from a place of being completely comfortable. So, and, and some things he says to just kind of stoke the fire, you know what I mean? Yeah. But he's, he, he, he stands for something that he's, you're not going to sway him on his opinion, right? Like, like he's, and I, and that I respect him. So even if I don't agree with him, I respect him and it, it, it brings me back to yeah. watch the show some more so even a you know we got a everybody has a love hate relationship with him. well sometimes uh, we get done with him <laughs> i go sit down somewhere yeah me, but, where are you from <laughs> where are you from originally uh, originally from houston texas well that, that, that i lived in i lived in chicago the okay. midwest for years and now i'm back in houston so okay are you a, are you a cowboys fan or are you a texas fan no or, or? i you know what i usually i i root for whoever I root, you know, I don't really root for anybody. I just like oh, to have good. parties. I just like to have parties. You know, for me, it's about the camaraderie, the festivity, you know what I'm saying? It's about the food and the drink and having a reason to like, just bring everybody Be together. together. Yeah. yeah. I, and then I, I choose at the last minute, but I get real, like, even if I, I could have not followed a, a football team whatsoever, but then when I'm watching like the Super Bowl. I'm, my heart is racing like I've been be them the whole season. I said, this is just too much stress. <laughs> I'm not inviting this stress. So <laughs> That's funny because those are two different, really different environments. I, I like I like Houston a lot. It's, I think it's it's a super cool, it's a lively city. I think it's a growing city. Chicago is much more, uh, it's, a, it's not different. I don't know. I, it's funny because I feel like Chicago is uh, your cookie cutter city. Like a lot of things that, that kind of go on and go on, whereas Houston's much more, um, there's a lot more culture involved in stuff that's going on still. So I, I kind of like that. Where are you based? I'm, I'm based, I'm in New Jersey today, but I'm from Brooklyn originally. And I lived in Manhattan for a long time. So New York. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. yeah you know, and, and of course a New Yorker would say some of those things about Chicago because Chicago is the second city. As yes. <laughs> and I got mad love for Chi-Town, you know, yeah. like, I, it's a beautiful city, but I think that, you know, we, we have to be, uh, and this goes to a space of awareness, right? Like when I was living in Chicago, I enjoyed the city on a surface level. And I, I had to start really checking in with myself to see how that city was really fueling me. How was it inspiring me? How was it healing me? If you're dealing with frustrations, if you're dealing with challenges, if you're feeling like you're stuck in places, if you feel like you're, you're not gaining momentum, it may not always necessarily be about what you're doing or not doing. Uh, we reside in, in cities that carry our energy, you know? And so if it speaks to you, then, then go for it. But 
take a look at it and see, is it the city that's not inspiring me? Do I need to, do I need a change of environment? And I think Chicago was great for me while the time that I was there. But let me tell you something. I do not miss scraping ice and snow <laughs> off of my windshield. Uh, ever, I right? I do not miss shoveling. I do not miss leaving a chair to reserve my parking space so that, <laughs> you, know, you know, like I, I don't miss a lot of those things. So coming back to Houston, where I was born, I always say I, I penetrated this realm here in Houston, uh, the land of Beyonce. Uh, <laughs> the humidity does right for my body. I don't feel tense. My body feels relaxed. Yeah. Um, but these are these are observations that are we be, that I feel like naturally happen with great speakers. But when you become aware of how your environment inspires you, how it affects you. Uh, it, it then it gives you more authority in how you can show up in places. And so I, I kind of tie that all back to just showing up as a speaker. When you show up in places, assess your environment and how does it make you feel? It's, it's, it, yeah, that's amazing. And I hate cold and snow too at this point. So I'm with you on that. But, but, <laughs> but New York, uh, uh, I, I agree with you in a lot of ways. New York as an environment has always been really inspiring for me when I go back to Manhattan, when I go back to New York City, um, I get a lot of energy. Out of it. And at the same time, what we've gone through over the last few years, when it was a city that was really under attack at all times, whether it was rioting or shutdown or whatever it was, it was it was hurtful too. So, I, like, I get what you're saying. Like, your environment can really influence who you are every single day. Yeah, it, it really does. So, again, if you're if you're journaling, you know, like those are things to journal about. Um, if you're journaling and you're new to it go online and say journal prompts, right? Like what are some prompts that I can, you know, start off with? But sometimes you need to, I also believe when, when you're a great speaker and you seem to connect with the audience or you have great command or you have great presence, it also means that you have high level observations. That means you're, you're recognizing people in the back, you're recognizing people in the front, you're considering how they're sitting, you're considering the, the, the temperature in the room, you're considering maybe where they just came from, you're considering where, they, where they're going next. Like that type of level of observation, you practice first with yourself. Observe your own, if you can't observe your own personal environment and see how it influences you, how can you expect to command a room and have presence in a room when you can't observe that environment and assume and use your intuition to figure out how they're being inspired or affected by the environment? That's really you know, good. Like when you're, when, if you really wanna show up, if you really wanna command a room, you are, you're taking over the entire room you are understanding the, the, the energy levels of everybody. But it starts with making keen observations. And if you aren't familiar or, or if you aren't apt to making keen observations, that's where the journaling can come into play. That's awesome. Yeah, it's a really, really good tip. I, I cut a lot. <laughs> I, 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 I've heard you speak about uh, your inner leader. Um, you know, so what is that? How do, you, how do you really put that into action? Yeah, I think that it, your inner leader is is really anchoring in just one thing that you know can't nobody tell you nothing about. <laughs> can't nobody tell me nothing about this, right? <laughs> and and to grow that feeling, it could it doesn't always have to be it doesn't have to be big or deep. Like, what's my purpose? And you know, this is my title. I'm the associate vice president of this, and can't nobody tell me about this. Sometimes is can't nobody tell me about basketball. Can't, no, can't nobody tell me about cooking, you know? Can't nobody come and tell me about this, that, and the other, right? You know, and so when you can anchor yourself in that, whatever that is, that whatever that can't nobody tell me about, you know, just understand what it feels like to really believe that can't nobody tell me nothing about this, right? Um, because that right there, if you were to... If you were to take that feeling and kind of put it in a box, if you open the box, that is the thing that grows the confidence. That thing, when you say, can't nobody tell me about making pies. Like I know everything that there is make, about making pies. That feeling, when you approach making pies, when you make pies, that's the feeling that you wanna grow. And so the more that you can anchor yourself in some of those feelings of can't nobody tell me nothing about, 
then your overall confidence will grow. It, it becomes a fact. So you can't negate it. And that's, want, that's the certainty that's needed for confidence. I, I want to uh, compliment you first on how clearly you're making this stuff and how easy you're making it. But the second thing I want to recognize now at this point, and, and you said it, and, that, and I see you putting it into action, right? When I asked you a question, and for everybody who's listening, I didn't send Shahana any of these questions beforehand. This is, she's, uh, this is, this is completely improv. Um, you answer them very eloquently and, and, and in detail, and there's no ums and there's no ahs. And, you, and, and it tells me that you're just very comfortable in speaking in life, right? You're very comfortable in having a conversation. So what you're, you said to us as, as pillars and stuff you need to use, you, you're really showing me that you do every single day. Yeah. And you know, the, the, the example that I love to give is, well, one, don't compare, your, don't compare yourself to me. Come to me for me to help you. But don't compare yourself to me because you ain't going to be me. You ain't never, can't nobody <laughs> tell me about, you know, what, you know like that's, that's how crude I am, right? But uh, I use uh, comedians, for, it, uh, for example. And I, quite honestly, Ralph, like that's kind of on my bucket list. Like, you know, you I, I'm it? actually getting nervous just thinking about it. Like <laughs> my heart rate is going up because on my bucket list is to, cultivate like a, a seven minute set as a, as a stand up awesome. comic, right? Woo, I'm getting nervous. <laughs> so anyways, I love to use comedians as, as an example. Like when you see Dave Chappelle on stage today and when you see his greatness and his genius, please do understand that that is a culmination of years uh, Going, going back to whenever he said that he probably started, maybe it was when he was seven, maybe it was when he was 17. I think he was on and, stages when he was 17 already. So you're right, it was young. Yeah. <laughs> and what happens with, what happens when you go see a comedy show, even if you go to a local, like go to one of your lo local comedy clubs or whatever. Um, and that set that you see has been cultivated. They've done that exact same set probably 20, 30 times before you even saw it, right? Sometimes when you see a bad comic, it doesn't mean that they're not funny. It just means that that's probably the first time that they're delivering that new content Correct, and they yeah. haven't figured it out yet. And so what they do is, is they, and even all of the greats, they talk about it. They, they go, they tour some small, that's why you'll find like, you know, celebrity comics popping yeah. up at like places that you would never expect. Yeah, oh, see, my God, it, they fell in the house, like yeah. hole in the walls, because they have to practice their new material and they have to allow it to fall flat or they see where they get the laugh. And when they see where they get the laugh, they say, ooh, that's the button. Then they go back next weekend, they find another audience and they deliver it differently, trying to get that button again. And then they do it. And then before you know it, they're layering what works and eliminating what doesn't. And so 25, 30 years later, you see a comic who just seems to do it effortlessly. He has now internalized almost the calculations that are necessary for a button to even exist. And so if you see yourself as a great speaker, speaking with ease, you know, um, allowing things to flow, to be eloquent, to be witty or whatever. Give yourself time and allow yourself to show up every time you open up your mouth in public speaking, allow yourself to show up in those stages. And then you'll start to see, you'll say something and it works and it becomes a thing. Ralph, do you have like a, a, a old uncle who tells the same story all the time? Yeah, I just, I just talked to him this morning, actually. The same story, the same jokes for like a hundred years. Yes, I have that. <laughs> and, and are they funny? Yes. <laughs> okay. Even though you've heard him a thousand times. Yeah. At some point, what's your uncle's name? Uh, Justin. At some point, Uncle Justin, and how, how old is he? What, like maybe 66 or something? No, like he's like 70. He's probably 70, 74 now. 74. And he's still going strong with the joke. So yeah, he's, he's good. <laughs> and, he, and this is one of the jokes that he probably used. He probably, he probably stumbled upon it when he was 43. You're right. And he's been telling him for 30 years. You're hundred percent right. Yeah. It's a, you know, that's... <laughs> So uh, the comedy thing makes it very, very clear. It really does. And, and you definitely have to, I'm sure you've been to New York, but you definitely have to come here more because I've seen Chris Rock, Kevin Hart, Dave Chappelle all doing that. 
right? They're all practicing in, in comedy clubs in New York City. They come all the time to do it. Um, but it's funny, you're right, because they sometimes they get on stage. It's like, I saw this guy, he wasn't funny, it's right? Because he was practicing his, and just like us, mm-hmm. you, know, uh, you know, like you never know what you're catching, what, what day you're catching people on, but eventually it becomes y- your routine. Because <laughs> Rob, how many, how many episodes, uh, about how many episodes of your podcast have you recorded thus far? We're probably, we're over a year, so we're doing it once a week. So I would say between 50 and 60. Yeah, and, yeah. and have you, what, what do you feel like you've found from day one doing your podcast to now that you know works when you're when you're interviewing? I think that um, to, to listen to the conversation I'm having during it and don't don't just go off questions, like to listen to where the conversation is going and to go there, right? Because um, I tend to speak about what I'm working on at the moment or what I'm really into at the moment and that's what I'm passionate about. So I try to give people the same opportunity that, hey, I know I have your bio and it said that you did this 10 years ago, but what are you, what are you passionate about today? Because that's, I think that's where the best material comes from. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so from the time that you started your podcast to now, uh, imagine how much more your brain is able to calculate in being an active listener. That's a good point. You're right. You know, the way that you're able to connect dots and connect ideas. It, your, your computing system is much more advanced because you've been practicing for over a year on being an active listener. Yeah, that's a, it's a really good point too. And it actually, this forces me to shut up and listen and pay attention, right? So it's, it's because sometimes you're always, you, you, you want to talk right away instead of listening. So this has definitely slowed me down that way, which is, which is great. So it's a really good point. It's a very, very valid point. Yeah. And I mean, that's even, and I, and I'm doing it now, like you're interviewing me, but I just asked you some questions. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, right. Tell me about you, Ralph. Like, <laughs> how did you feel? Because you're, you, I, I find that podcasters are great examples of, or, or I would say like great case studies. And I'm going to put you out there, Ralph. Y'all, if you're listening out there, Go listen to Ralph's first podcast <laughs> and then re-listen to this podcast and take some time to just really think to yourself, oh, wow, what, what did Ralph do? What, what is Ralph better at now? And yeah. you'll, you'll be able to say something. It's, it's funny because I have a friend that I've made through this. Uh, his name is Craig Siegel. He has a podcast called The CLS, CLS Movement. And it's excellent. He's been getting better and better guests and he's getting better and better at it. And he really prides himself on his intro. He does this, this intro that's great every single time. He works really hard. And everybody, like, he had Ben Baller on today. And then Ben Baller was kind of, like, blown away. He was like, I don't even know what to say after that intro. But what I, what I, I messaged him this morning to say is, hey, this is your podcast. You're so much more comfortable in how you sound and how you speak and how confident you are that it sounds like a different podcast. So it's funny you're saying that to me because I just had this conversation this morning with somebody. So again, uh, you're in my brain, which it's a little bit scary, but we'll <laughs> keep moving and, on, I, on. and I knew you had an uncle that yes. probably had this. <laughs> but here's, here's the other thing. That is, how should I put this? You can lean into shared experiences that you know we all probably have. Mm-hmm. Ralph, we all have that uncle that does that same thing over and over again. You, the people that are listening to this podcast, you know, you and I are the only ones that have that uncle that has the same story. You or can that relate, guy. yeah, that can relate, you're right. You know, so it, I'm trusting that, I'm trusting that our experiences are similar. I'm trusting that we're more connected than we are not connected. So when I throw stuff out there like that, most times there's someone who's going to be like, oh yeah, I got an uncle. Yeah. You know? And what's what's smart about that is that I like that approach to conversation because it's better than saying we're too different. How am I going to have a conversation with this person? Like this, there's too much different about us and they're not going to know what I'm talking about. And, and so I, I, that's a better way to have it because, because you go into every conversation open-minded then like there's something about that. That's the same. Let's, uh, I'm going to figure it out. Yeah. So I like yeah, that yeah. it's conversation piece. And that, and that's why I always enjoy, like, even when um, I'm on podcasts and then the host gives me the questions I don't even look at the questions. Yeah, I'm the same. I don't even look at the questions. <laughs> and and people who are listening, you're probably like, oh my God, I got to know the questions. I need to know the questions. You don't need to know the questions when you know you have the answers. Yes, you're right. When you yeah. know you have the answers, you don't even need to know the questions. And if you're familiar with that warehouse of thoughts and ideas in your brain, you can ask the question, 
take a moment. Oh, okay, Ralph. That reminds me of a time that dot, dot, dot. Yeah. You don't need, y'all, uh, free yourselves. <laughs> the, the preparation, the real preparation is just showing up and trusting. But doing that journaling, getting familiar with yourself and not being afraid to flub, not being afraid to misstep. And then perhaps probably the next thing is just saying, well, shoot, I don't know. Just saying like, you know yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, but, but just what you said today, just in our conversation today, um, I read, I read every single day and I pray every single day, right? So those are two things I did every single day. I still have trouble meditating, but I, I'm working on it, right? But two of the things you said today, um, I've used today in this conversation, something I read, I spoke to you about something. And, and you know, so I, I, I've used some of the stuff that from my daily routines that helped this conversation. Mm -hmm. That helped my public speaking. Yeah, and, <laughs> and Ralph, you're right. Like that, the reading part, the reason why I can I, I I can reach for words is because I read a lot of words. I'm not regurgitating the same lexicon that I have kind of implanted in my brain. Yeah. So when I read a book, I'm picking up their the way that they talk and, and I'm picking up different words. You know, reading reading is fundamental, y'all. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I used to hate reading as a kid. It's me too. It's funny that I read so much now. I hated it too. Right. It was the dumbest thing <laughs> as a kid. I had a cousin. She loved to read. And I used to always give her the side eye. Like, <laughs> my <laughs> kids love to read. And I look at them sometimes. I'm like, I don't even know who, where you guys came from. <laughs> they love to read. Yeah. Right. So, so now uh, for those of you, uh, you know, who like, okay, I want to speak off the cup. Oh, let me, let me share with you what's funny. People always say, I want to speak off the cuff, right? I want to go from the dome. I want to talk <laughs> off the top, right? Do you know that speaking off the cuff is not really what you think it is? In fact, okay, I'm listening. <laughs> I don't know what century this was, but it wasn't late, it wasn't recent centuries. It was like <laughs> centuries like Shakespeare type, you know. I don't know if that's even centuries ago. I don't even know when Shakespeare was around. But, anyways, back in Shakespeare time. <laughs> When they were acting, and if they were having trouble remembering their lines, they would write their lines on the cuffs of their shirts. That's interesting. That's, 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 <laughs> so you just to, broke the myth. <laughs> to give themselves a cue. Like, so they're talking in their oratory, you know, and, and you know, they just looked at their cuff. And they just created a, a small cue to remind them of what's coming next. So even when you're speaking off the cuff, you prepared that moment because you knew that there was going to be a moment where you're like, this is, you know what, I'm going to probably forget this. So let me write this down. Let me create a bullet point for myself. Let me sit and pontificate. That's another word, meaning hey, ponder. You know, good. Let me sit, let me sit <laughs> and percolate on <laughs> these thoughts. And you become more familiar with it. So release the idea that, you're going to just speak off the cuff. Like you can just show up in any environment and just flow with it. And even though I'm flowing, some of these stories that I've shared, I've done before. So if you listen to my, if you go back and try to find me on other podcasts, you're going to hear me share similar things. This ain't new y'all. This ain't new stuff. I ain't just coming up with this stuff. I've, <laughs> I've said it in some way, form or fashion before. So release yourself from thinking or having that expectation that speaking off the cuff is a real thing. You know, we all have moments where we get this like divine flow and we just start to speak. Uh, same thing with comedians. Comedians have moments where they just drop a joke that they've never done before. And it's yeah. funny, but I bet you they keep it and do it again. And we just, I, that's unfortunately, kind of, I think we just saw that happen with the Oscars or Chris Rock said something that he wasn't prepared to say. So, but you're right, it didn't, it didn't go over so well. But, um, I, you know, it's funny that you say, comedians is such a hot topic at this point now. And I love comedians. And I, I um, so I think it's great that you're looking to do that in life. Uh, I, 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 think <gasps> it's, I think it's a great, I, 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 can see your, I can see your whole being, but I, it's just, uh, it's not, it's funny because when you listen to interviews of comedians when they're off of 
stage, right? Oh, and they're just behind, and they're very uh, insecure, uncomfortable people. So that's not, I don't get that from you, is what I'm saying to you. So I, I think you try to do something that's completely out of your comfort zone to, to, to get on stage and do that because I, you know, I, I, that's what I get from, not Dave Chappelle, but a lot of them, that's what you get from them. They're, they're just very like, I don't know what I'm doing, you know? Yeah. <laughs> But you know what uh, comedians are also good for? I think I may have to write an article about this, but comedians are also good. And we hear this all the time. I want to be a better storyteller. <laughs> That's and a buzzword these days. Yeah, for sure. I know. Oh. I, I'm kind of annoyed. I'm like, okay, you want to be a storyteller. <laughs> You know, but you don't even believe that your story is interesting. Interesting, so, uh, yes. Yeah, so how are you going to tell the story? <laughs> right. But comedians are great storytellers. But the what makes them great storytellers, I believe, are, are two things. Um, and it could be more. But one, the, the commonality, the things that we all experience. Like you and I telling the story of Uncle Justin and the joke and how he probably started it when he was 43, you know, probably at his sister's wedding and he's still telling it <laughs> and he's still telling it right so, but as i'm as we're telling the story of uncle justin and his his jokes people are starting to wrap their mind with what does uncle justin look like like <laughs> yeah right sound like? Does, you know? and so but they also have their own uncle which makes the story that much more relevant that is a good story because it's something that we can all identify with right and the second part of I believe telling good stories is really allowing your imagine as, as adults, we don't do this enough, but really allowing our imaginations to paint the pictures, really yeah. allowing ourselves to go into our mind and be in that world. And so if you can, if you're explaining something or you're talking about something, a great way to share your idea about it is to really imagine what does it look like? What does it feel like? Where would we be? Like when I gave Without that example it. of like a box and then the confidence is like- that, in that, the, You're in right. The That's a good point. Where would, it, where would it be? Is it really, you know what I mean? Like where would that- where, So <laughs> I have a million, I could probably keep going with you for hours, by the way, but I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you go. But I, ha I have another, I have one question I wanted to close with. Uh -huh. um, what is the difference for you between speaking from your heart and speaking from your mind? Ooh, good question, Ralph. Everybody <laughs> clap for Ralph right now. <laughs> he deserves a round of applause for that. <laughs> um, so speaking from your heart is definitely intuitive based. Speaking from your heart is definitely more emotional based. So you have you have ethos, which is a, a, a way of connecting and communicating. You know, you connect through people's emotions. Um, speaking from your heart, I believe, is also a space where you can uh, be more authentic, where you can channel more vulnerability. Uh, I always say that vulnerability is the most direct route to connection, so don't take the detour. So if you feel like you're not warming up to people, if you feel like you're not building quick rapport with people, you're probably speaking from your mind and not your heart. So your heart is going to be mushy gushy. You know, your heart is going to be about felt, the things felt and feelings. Um, your heart is going to be about trusting what you're saying, even though your mind is telling you something else. Your heart is exercising intuition, you know? Speaking from your mind, I believe comes with a bit more intentionality. Speaking with your mind is about fact. It's about logic. I think speaking from your mind uh, comes from a place of, of practice. Speaking from your mind is, oh, I've talked about this before, so I can talk about it again today. Speaking from your heart is probably coming up with something that you probably never shared before. Like when I shared, when I shared to you today that I was like, it's on my bucket list to, to do a <laughs> you know, stand up. Like that was a little bit me more speaking from my heart. Like, oh, yeah, I got it. But the examples that I gave about what makes great storytelling, commonalities and painting a picture that's speaking from my mind because I know that I've taught that before and I know that I've said that before. So, you know, I think that in short, 
speaking from your mind is coming from maybe a tested place, a practice place, a completed space, you've done it, you're familiar with it. Um, speaking from your heart is moving into new territory. It, 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 speaking from your heart is a little bit more about exploration. Speaking from your mind is about establishing things. Like speaking from your heart says, we're gonna go and explore the, the wild, wild west. Yeah. What is out there? You know, I want to explore. Yeah. But then speaking from your mind is saying, you've showed up in that place, now what can we do with it? That's really good. That's amazing. I'm gonna, you've been amazing. Um, thank you so much for doing this. I, I learned a lot today. Um, I even learned some things about myself today that I didn't realize. So I what appreciate it. What did you learn it. about yourself today? I think that, you know, just like the preparation part, like I'm always so worried about being prepared all the time. Like I'm an over, like, I'm always like, I'm, I always feel like I'm not prepared enough. But what you said, you know, that we're preparing every single day, like I'm on this a lot and I'm speaking to my staff a lot and, and, and my partners and I'm always preparing. So I should just, and now that you said that, and I was on a stage, uh, I guess it's almost two weeks ago at this point. Now we had a big event up here and I was on stage all day. I was hosting. Um, and I felt really comfortable up there and, and I didn't have to prepare for it. And I was moving around because I, I didn't have necessarily prepared keynote, right? I just had to kind of be up there. But the truth of the matter is, is that I could have probably given a keynote because I was just, but so thank you. I appreciate that's, that. <laughs> that's when you know you've gotten to a place of um, self-mastery, right? Like the preparation has always, you, you've grown to a point now where the year of podcast episodes, the year of pitching and selling the podcast, the year of educating people on the podcast, like talking to people about the podcast, that the podcast has been your platform to improve your public speaking skills. And now you're showing up in spaces where you're like, huh, I can just go with the flow right now. But you're going with the flow, but it, it, was, a, it was a whole Hoover Dam that you, you know, were working on prior to, you you're know? Right. So congratulations to you, Rao. Thank you. And th congratulations on everything. And uh, you've been great. I'm definitely going to continue to follow you and see everything you have going on. And is there anything, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you if they want to speak to you? Yeah, so um, I'm on Instagram. I'm on the gram. Uh, so I definitely am uh, on there. Uh, LinkedIn too. Now I'm moving a lot of, I'm, uh, between LinkedIn and Instagram, video content, for uh, Instagram, if you want to, you know, just hear more insights about public speaking, communicating, expressing yourself um, at Shahara. Uh, but then if you want to move into the space of intentional practice, uh, become a part of our community at Speak House. Uh, we're all about building uh, bold and confident speakers. Uh, we have a uh, group coaching option that we have available in the virtual space. So, and we offer a virtual workshop every month. So even if you're listening to this and this podcast came out six months ago, hey, still go to speakhouse.com and that's H-A-U-S uh, and uh, join us at, for one of our socials. Um, sit in, get your feet wet, uh, expose yourself more to uh, what it means to be intentional about improving your public speaking skills. So follow us on Instagram and LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn and Instagram and join us for a social virtually. I would love to have you as a part of our community. Oh, you're awesome. And I'm definitely, I'm following you the second we get off this phone call. So, <laughs> this is real, so you're, we're, we're good to go. But and, thank you again. Thank you again so much. And when I do make it to New York, we got to get together. I think, 100%. That, I think that's on the horizon for sure. Yeah, and, I, and we're going to go to some comedy clubs. <laughs> that would be perfect yeah yeah it's definitely <laughs> sure thank you get your i really appreciate you thank you Mark. thank you